Welcome to Fast Keto. I'm your host, Keto Jenna Girl. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Fast Keto. I am delighted to have Ali Miller joining us today. She is an integrative functional medicine practitioner with a background in naturopathic medicine. She is a registered and licensed dietitian, certified diabetes educator, and has a contagious passion for food as medicine, developing clinical protocols and virtual programs using nutrients and food as the foundation of treatment. I recently had the pleasure of getting to meet Ali in person in Austin, her hometown at KetoCon. And I really enjoy her food as medicine philosophy. It's very much aligned with my own and it is supported by up-to-date scientific research for a functional approach to healing the body. Her message has really been able to influence millions through media with TV segments, features in O Magazine, Women's Health, Prevention Magazine. She has an award-winning podcast called Naturally Nourished, which you may know her from. And within the medical community. Her expertise is also well known. She can be accessed through her website, Ali Miller RD, which has her blog, virtual learning, access to her practice, Naturally Nourished. And she just released a brand new book called The Anti-Anxiety Diet. And I can't wait to dig into all things whole foods and whole foods healing with Ali today. I hope that you guys enjoy this episode. If you are interested in trying out a ketogenic diet for yourself or you have been doing keto for a while and just not getting the results that you're looking for, I recommend you check out my 28 day ketogenic girl challenge. What it is is a full 28 day meal plan and program that includes all the recipes and foods that you need to eat for 28 days. I call it the 28 day challenge because it's just a great way to get past all the information overwhelm. There's so much information online about keto And this way you can just get past that. All the macros are calculated for you to get into a state of ketosis. And I was able to do that by using tried and true proven macro approaches that I've developed over several years of doing the keto diet and working with over 3000 people to date on this program. Our ketogenic girl community in the members group is incredible. Everyone in there is so supportive, providing helpful tips and hints and sharing their successes and struggles and challenges as well in the group together because we're all in this together gaining more help. The 20 day challenge program comes with weekly shopping lists, meal plan overviews, a guide to testing yourself and interpreting the results for keto. And it also comes with my support and coaching in our members only group. So go check it out at ketogenicgirl.com. It's the 20 day challenge and any purchase of the 20 day meal plans gets you access into the challenge. You can choose to get the program either soft copy or with a printed copy as well. It's printed on beautiful paper, spiral bound, and I ship it out to you the same day. So go check it out. The 20 day ketogenic girl challenge at ketogenicgirl.com. A few disclaimers. By listening to this podcast, you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice as I am not a qualified healthcare provider. The information presented on this podcast is for educational purposes only. Ketogenic Girl is not qualified to provide medical advice. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to this podcast. Prior to beginning a ketogenic diet, you should undergo a full health screening with your physician to confirm that a keto diet is suitable for you and to rule out any conditions or contraindications that may pose risk or that are incompatible with a ketogenic diet. A keto diet may or may not be appropriate for you if you have any kind of health condition, whether known to you or unknown. So you must consult your physician to find this out. Anyone under the age of 18 should consult with their physician and their parents or legal guardian. Hey, Ali, how are you this morning in Austin? I am doing awesome, just surviving the heat. (laughs) Awesome and awesome. I'm really, really jealous because I got to go to Austin twice this year and both times I had to fly in and out and the city is so fantastic. It's such a fun city and I want to explore it more. And how long have you been living there? I actually just moved here last May. So I opened my clinic in Houston, Texas in 2012 and lived there. And then when my daughter was 
was about to turn one, I was like, let's move to the hills. We need nature. (laughs) So I I transitioned to virtual and um, I work with patients now, still a full client load, but I do it all through the home setting and wear my slippers. And it's been nice to kind of stay a little bit more rooted within my household. When I was in the grind of the office setting, I would be locked and loaded for like 10 to 12 hour days. So it was really difficult to have any source of balance. And also when you are in metropolitan area and you don't have that, I'm, I'm very connected where like I need to root, I need to hike. <laughs> so just a couple of days ago, my husband and I were kayaking on the Colorado River and it's been a good transition to say the least. <laughs> That's awesome. It is such a beautiful city and I'm looking forward already to KetoCon next year and I'm going to come for longer so I can really get to visit it more. It it is so, so cool. And it's so interesting to me because very similar to Denver, which is where my husband's from and where we're probably going to settle once we're done adventuring over in Europe. It's like one of the fastest growing cities in the US. So even when I came between November and June, I was like, whoa, (laughs) there's just so much happening and so much growth. And it's really, really cool to see that. So many people are loving the city and moving there. For sure. For sure. Well, for anyone listening who may not know of you yet and your work yet, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I went to a naturopathic college of medicine back in, oh goodness, 2006, I believe, and Bastyr University, which is the only accredited naturopathic college through the American Medical Association. And instead of becoming a naturopathic doctor, I actually became a registered dietitian. And following my coursework there, I did a lot of electives there, like herb, wild herb foraging and mushroom identification and natural medicine making. I worked in the naturopathic clinic in downtown Seattle, where I would have patients that we'd work with with our practitioners overseeing our process. And then I went to Houston to work in the Texas Medical Center for my dietetic internship, sat for my boards and worked for a physician's group as their director of integrative medicine for three years. And so I often say that I kind of have a unique upbringing in the sense of my didactic educational component being more naturopathic and then had this immersion into more of what would be called allopathic or what you see in standard American medicine. And I kind of put a a leg on each bank of the river, if you will. And then, like I said, in 2012, I opened my own clinic, Naturally Nourished. So I practice what's called functional integrative medicine. And what this is, is truly being a detective of the body, working with each patient as a unique individual and understanding what are their root causes of dysfunction and then working to resolve from the root versus just symptom management. Right. And that was going to be my next question for you is kind of, you know, you hear a lot about functional medicine. I think the questions that most people have are what are the main differences between functional medicine and, you know, traditional or Western medicine? I think one of the easiest ways to understand it is that unfortunately, in a Westernized form of medicine, because there's such an integration with billing and coding and insurance, (laughs) it makes things a little bit mucky where the doctor or the practitioner comes in looking to diagnose and looking to quote unquote treat and their treatments are very regulated by a lot of standards, by a lot of, you know, billable codes and such. And they all become very algorithm based, meaning that there's kind of these already preset conditions, if you will, of if cholesterol is high, prescribe a statin, boom, boom, boom. You know, there's the one plus two equals three approach. And in functional medicine, the idea is that we're looking at optimizing function of the body to provide optimal health, not just manage disease. And we're trying to see a unique whole person healthcare model versus isolating with different specialists. You know, in in a a westernized setting, we're going to have your gastroenterologist or GI doc that doesn't talk to your endocrinologist that's managing your diabetes, who's not talking to your gynecologist who's managing your estrogen dominance, you know? And so you get a lot of voices that may not have a harmonious outcome. And the idea with functional medicine is if you find in the root cause of all of those practitioners, maybe inflammation, maybe it's toxicity, maybe it's micronutrient deficiency. And so working kind of on the whys versus just the what's. 
That's so interesting. And you just released a brand new book. It's called The Anti-Anxiety Diet. So is there a specific trend that you're seeing or why did you decide to focus specifically on anxiety? For sure. So yeah, you know, when I'm spending my initial consultation with the patient is 90 minutes in length and I spend the first 60 minutes just being a detective, like literally asking them so many questions where they often leave that first session knowing more about themselves than they did (laughs) prior to discussing themselves with me. And I always spend about 10 to 15 minutes talking about stress because it's called the HPA access, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenals. And this HPA access is what drives our sympathetic nervous system or fight or flight mechanisms in the body. And I often find that many people report to me, oh, you know, my stress levels are moderate or, you know, (laughs) oh, I just am doing all these things. I'm relocated. I'm an attorney at this clinic or, oh, I am a mom doing this and that. It's just normal, quote unquote, stress. And then when I ask them deeper questions about, you know, do you grind your jaw? Do you clench your jaw, grind your teeth? Do you have heart palpitations? How's your sleep patterns? And all of these other physiological impacts of mismanaged stress access, I find that anxiety and, you know, racing thoughts, uh, anticipatory distress or rumination about the past is really the Achilles heel in many avenues of wellness. So, you know, it can influence our blood sugar levels. It can influence our gut lining. It can influence our microbiome. And so my book takes this position of six different foundational R's, if you will. I used R's, I guess, just to make it sexy (laughs) and have it be thematic, but uh, six different entry points of what could be drivers of or perpetuators of anxiety and how you can address each of those different areas for whole body health. Now, what is unique about your particular approach? Well, because it is functional medicine based, you know, each R again is is looking at a different mechanism of the body. So we're talking about reducing inflammation. We're talking about in that element, I'm removing inflammatory foods. And the fifth food that we focus on is sugar. And I right away in, in chapter two, start talking about the ketogenic diet, which I'm sure we'll get into later today. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we've seen so many benefits of ketones and their ability to have neurological impact on the body and anxiety and mood stability is a huge component. So I think that's a unique element. Definitely, even within the keto world, we don't talk about, we talk about it for neurological health, for multiple sclerosis and for Alzheimer's disease and so forth, but not often as a mood stabilizer. So my book goes into a lot of research on anxiety and depression and ketosis. And then beyond removing inflammation and removing excess sugar or carbs from the diet, we go into looking at rebalancing our microbiome, resetting the gut bacteria or the bugs that play a role in manufacturing our neurotransmitters. We go into repairing the gut lining and why that's important, restoring micronutrient status. So I talk about different amino acids or protein building blocks that actually work as precursors or uh, basically the builder to make serotonin and dopamine and GABA. And then my last two R's, are honestly, I think the final R is really where most of the westernized medicine focuses. So my fifth R is rebounding the adrenals, which is that A in that HPA access. So we talk about cortisol and epinephrine and some of the neurotransmitters in the adrenal glands. And the final R is rebalancing your neurotransmitters. Whereas in westernized medicine, the first line of defense is an SSRI drug or an SSRNI, basically drugs that modulate the reuptake or the expression of our serotonin rather than wondering why it might be off in the first place. And if it's off, that might not even be the cause of anxiety in the first place. I love how you have this foundation of these six different aspects because they really contribute all together harmoniously to not experiencing anxiety and Anyone who's ever dealt with anxiety knows, you know, how torturous, how horrible it is, you know, and there are so many different aspects to it and it can be confusing. You know, do I focus on, on my gut or do I focus on taking these supplements to help with my adrenals or do I focus on taking 5-HTP for my neurotransmitters? Like there's all these different things and you don't know 
which one it is. Could it be my gut lining? But when you put all of them together, it makes so much sense. Like, I love that you outlined, you know, all the different aspects that contribute to having that calm and peaceful state. Totally, Vanessa. And you know, what's interesting is a lot of people don't want to deem anxiety, I think, because there's a dogma or an association of that being quote unquote mental illness. But like I said, this is a helpful tool for anyone that deals with stress. And we all do, (laughs) whether we deem it stress, whether we say we manage it well or not, this is really a way to foundationally heal the body more upstream. And, you know, by upstream, what I mean is we're getting ahead of other imbalanced symptoms. And so, you know, I have a quiz actually in every chapter to help you determine which entry point you need to focus on first. So one individual is going to really need to focus maybe more on the resetting their gut microbiome. So they may need to do a candida cleanse, or they may need to repollinate their gut with good bacteria. And that may need to be the first stage of focus for their approach. Whereas someone else, like you said, definitely might need to start right away with adrenal support because maybe they dealt with the hurricane recently, you know, they were displaced and they're still in that fight or flight adrenaline mode. And now they've kind of been that buzzing fly that's hit the wall and has crashed. And then, you know, a new mom that just carried a baby and is breastfeeding might need to focus on restoring their micronutrients because they're just creating another being from their body's nutritional storage. (laughs) So, you know, everyone's going to have a different part that will speak to them. They're all very important and it's important to address all elements, but we're all going to have one part that's going to be more dominant and then, you know, secondary and tertiary or so forth. It's amazing because I'm looking at your list and I'm going, I literally went through all these foundations or stages by going on a keto diet. I was able to heal my gut. I had like really major gut distress for years. I was able to remove inflammatory foods, restore my micronutrients, adrenals, balance my neurotransmitters, all these things I did without knowing, you know, intentionally with each one by going on a keto diet. So I'm curious how you use keto as a tool with regards to this anti-anxiety approach that you have? Yeah. So just like everything, when I use food as medicine, it's a double-edged sword, right? So it's removing the compounds that can drive havoc and be a poison, if you will, to your system, as well as restoring and focusing on an abundance of the foods that are very therapeutic and healing. And so with the ketogenic approach, we're getting the benefit of regulating our glucose levels. And I reference even like the Journal of Diabetic Complications states that there's a three times times more likelihood of depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and other mood disorders when blood sugar levels are out of control. So when we regulate our blood sugar levels first and foremost, that's going to have this steady, even keeled approach. And I mean, we even see this with children, right? You remove sugary garbage from their diet and get them on higher fats, nut butters, eggs for breakfast, you know, and you see that their testing scores improve. You see ADHD goes down, hyperactivity. So just the blood sugar stability and getting healthy fats into the diet first and foremost. Fats are really the high octane fuel for the brain. They really aid in cognitive function and balance on a neurological level. And then when we get the carbs at, you know, each individual's unique, but I start my book at 30 grams or less to get people ketogenic. You know, when we go deeper down the rabbit hole into keto, We know the role of ketones in epilepsy, right? You know, they actually are able to sit on our elements of the brain that drive excitatory neurotransmitter expression to the level of seizure activity. So that same excitatory process of epinephrine and impulsivity can be seen with panic attack and anxiety. So when we actually have ketones available as fuel source, as a hybrid machine versus just running on glucose, we see not only small smooth, steady mood from blood sugar maintenance, but we see improved cognition. We see a very grounded state and our neuropeptides, the actual ketones can cross our blood brain barrier and act on our neuropeptides, which reduce the signals of anxiety. And they also help to work on GABA expression and GABA. We don't talk about as much as serotonin with mood, but GABA plays a huge role in inhibitory or kind of a stress managing, mellowing out function in our system. That is so, so cool, you know, because I always think about keto and all the incredible benefits that it has for mental 
mental clarity, restoring homeostasis, hormonal function, optimizing all these different things. I never really thought about for the average person that you would get this therapeutic, you know, buffer to all these excitatory processes in the brain. Right. But like we experience it, like people (laughs) call it the keto high (laughs) or right. It's like, oh, it's so much easier to get along with. (laughs) My husband loves when I'm keto. (laughs) Yeah. Now, does keto just naturally do this or do you also need to supplement with GABA? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So, right. It both works as a neuropeptide to reduce the excitatory neuron activity and it also works on our GABA expression. And so, when we think of like Parkinson's disease, another big disease in the neurological family beyond epilepsy, when we get those tremors, that tremor type activity, that's due to a depletion of GABA or GABA receptor function. And so, like I said, in my clinic and actually in the book, I talk a lot about supplementation as well. So I have a a supplement in my line called GABA Calm and it's a chewable and I use it before I speak publicly. I use it before flying. Actually, when I take my two-year-old to toddler yoga, because sometimes she doesn't really cooperate the greatest. (laughs) And um, it just takes that white knuckle effect. And that's what even to the level of tremors is seen to be depleted. So ketones actually can enhance GABA expression. And then, you know, GABA can be used as a tool as needed in times of higher stress demand. Does keto just naturally do this or do you need to supplement with GABA as well? It just depends. Like I said, so ketones themselves do enhance GABA activity and expression in the brain. But like I said, when you're at times of higher need, you know, everyone's unique to their threshold and everyone's starting at a different point of burnout. But I I find that using GABA as an acute tool, not a daily tool, but as an as needed tool during times of high stress is very helpful. And so I use that as more of a direct tool, rather than, for instance, I'm not a big proponent of exogenous ketones. So I work with ketogenic diet and ketones as a baseline. And then I work with neurotransmitter tools, like you mentioned 5-HTP as well in individuals that have a need for serotonin support. So supplements can be used foundationally or more intermittently on a demand basis. It just really depends on the mechanism of action and the particular compound. Now, for someone who is looking at your procedure and your process you know, where should they start? Like, how do they know which one of the different R's to start with? Should they start with their gut lining and fortifying that? Or should they start with supplementing with this and that? How is it that they can determine through reading your book, which ones to zero in on and focus on? Yeah, so I put a quiz in each chapter, which helps to kind of guide you. So for instance, in like the microbiome chapter, it talks about if you've taken antibiotics in the past three years and the frequency. So you kind of score yourself with a tally system based on the frequency of, of use of something like Bactrim or tetracycline or you know, any antibiotic truly, which is kind of a, an atom bomb to the microbiome or a sterilizer. And then we have questions like, you know, if you experience yeast infections or UTIs, that would be another, of course, driver towards a a dysbiosis. If you experience fungal activity like earwax or dermatological conditions, if you have alcohol intolerance, if you have bloating or distension in the abdomen. So you kind of walk through, it's about 14 to 20 different questions per chapter and you score yourself on never, sometimes, and often. And then in the appendix of my book, I have a supplemental support table as well as advanced functional labs. So an individual may start, let's say, if their reset the microbiome is the highest scoring quiz, they may start with my uh, cleanse, a six-week cleanse to kind of plow the fields of the gut. Or if it's just a moderate scoring, they may start with a probiotic challenge. Because often if we don't tolerate probiotics, that means that we have a bad army of bacteria that's already set up camp and there's a battle environment when you consume those probacteria cultures. So that often means then you need to kind of plow the fields or do a cleanse before you can re-inoculate and grow the good guys. And that's where keto helps too, of course. As you reduce carbohydrates, bad bacteria and yeast love sugar. And so that's why a lot of us come into this sugar addiction because we have dysbiosis. So, you know, there's a quiz at each chapter and then you may decide even beyond supplements that, for instance, that individual may want to do a functional stool assessment 
to get even deeper down that rabbit hole and learn more about their biome. Now, I want to ask you about children and raising children in particular, because one of the challenges that I think is facing a lot of people who are keto and they want to raise their children in a low carb way and avoid sugar, but it's very difficult to do. And it's, you know, you don't want to get extreme and be kind of, you know, controlling every single thing that they eat. And yet it's so prevalent in social situations in schools and kids parties and activities and all these things. Is there a connection and do you see a connection directly between the consumption of sugar and high carb foods in children and kind of hyperactivity or ADHD and other kind of behavioral issues? Oh, absolutely. And it's unfortunately more and more prevalent especially with the screen addictive tendencies that we're seeing and the younger ages Mm -hmm. that we're exposing to screens that drives a lot of dopamine. And actually, you know, we see with like social media, (laughs) that's a dopamine surge, like, Ooh, you know, what's going on? How many likes, whatnot. And children to really get dopamine imbalance from the blue light and the screen exposure. And that's a new element in addition to sugar, but absolutely the big change that I see, and it's been studied in testing scores when kiddos don't get 15 grams. The magic number for breakfast, for instance, is 15 grams of protein. And that truly starts at like age six as a minimum need. So that's like two eggs essentially, you know, or that could be a couple slices of bacon and avocado and one egg, but getting protein and healthy fats are very grounding. It keeps their blood sugar levels very stable. And when they have instead a sugary cereal, they get that spike. As you know, they're going to get excess insulin and kiddos have high metabolism. So they may not show the body fat storage or the insulin resistance elements or dysmetabolic that we show as adults, but they definitely get the spike and the crash. And that creates that hanger effect. (laughs) And I'm sure we've all experienced that, you know, where it's like hungry, irritable and bitey and addictive and angry and needing that pick me up again. And that can really create this ADHD like Mm. vicious cycle. So I do work with kiddos. And the first thing I do as work with abundance, honestly, is adding healthy fats. Oh, I love that. Balancing out carbs, getting enough protein, and then the carbs just kind of fall to the wayside. So my two-year-old is paleo. She's not keto, she's paleo, and she consumes starchy vegetables and fruits. But our big rule is no naked carbs. (laughs) Oh, I love that. So, you know, she would never just have like an apple on its own. She always has to have nut butter with it. And that would come, you know, with or after a grass fed burger patty or something like that as well. I mean, I know children naturally just have so much energy and they're always running around. I just sometimes wonder how much of it is added to or contributed to or what factor is the sugar in the diet because there is so much of it. I remember being a kid, sugar and candy and carbs were constantly part of my (laughs) diet and lifestyle. you will. And I'm curious what, and if you've seen a difference sort of with paleo children or or kids who are raised, maybe eating lower carb and and kind of what you've seen in your practice. Yes. And you know, I mean, I know that my daughter, I'm not not testing her blood (laughs) by any means because I just don't need to, you know, but I know that she does run on and produce ketones as well. And you know, there's ketones in breast milk. So babies and babies in utero thrive on ketones. So, you know, I think that again, and there's this kind of all or nothing approach. And when I look at like the American pediatric guidelines of what to feed a child, it is such a disservice to set up our children for successful outcomes in school. And unfortunately, we're medicating children so much earlier. And there's so many studies that when you bring in these medications, whether they're ADHD drugs or anxiety drugs or antidepressants, that they're five times more likely to have a more severe mental illness by age 18. And so, you know, I think really allowing them to thrive and nourish their bodies with whole foods, grounding fats and proteins is where it starts foundationally. And then there can be strategic supplement use because some kiddos do have micronutrient deficiency as well. So like magnesium, you know, is the original chill pill. So I work with a lot of kiddos with magnesium bisglycinate and adults. I mean, that's a magic compound and it is a neuromuscular relaxer and it also helps with metabolizing cortisol, our main stress hormone. And it's really one of those 
uh, electrolytes that can be thrown off so much when we go very low carb as well. That's so interesting. And so you always recommend biglycinate. Is that the specific form as opposed to citrate or other forms? Yes. Yes. So, you know, citrate is a more water soluble form. So that's going to work a little bit more as like a stool softener. It can work a little bit as an electrolyte, but it's just kind of passing through the body. You're not going to get that neuromuscular impact. And then magnesium oxide and some of those other chelates like malate and those aren't as absorbed as readily. And so those also create more bowel reactivity versus true bioavailability in our system. So, you know, magnesium has over 300 different enzymatic properties. And a lot of us think of it just as a stool softener, which using mag citrate with chronic constipation is okay. But when I see constipation, the first two nutrients I think of are magnesium and B12. And um, I like to use the most bioavailable form. Again, I want that individual to resolve the root versus just manage the symptom. So I don't want to just give them a stool softener and call it the day. I want to give them the magnesium bisglycinate. Maybe I'll titrate in the citrate a little bit to get them going. And then I'm also going to ensure they're getting two to three cups of leafy greens. They're using nut butters and getting food bioavailable forms as well. That's awesome. Now, just to shift gears a little bit, I want to talk about leaky gut and the connection between leaky gut and mood, mood stability, mood disorders, and all of that. It's huge. So there's actually research that shows that stress alone drives like drills into the gut lining. I mean, this actually blew my mind because I've been a clinician now for 10 years and I've been treating leaky gut using things like bone broth and of course, removing inflammatory foods and working with gelatin and collagen and um, L-glutamine and other compounds to heal the gut lining because we know the gut associated lymphatic tissue or the GALT is really the foundation of our immune system. So many people that have auto immune disease have leaky gut as well, or a leaky gut can be the driver. So I've definitely been honed in on that for the last decade. And I've used elimination diets as a way to address what is causing distress in the body. But beyond that, I have found as I was really putting this whole book together, that they've done studies on individuals that were under high stress, social anxiety environment, and they measure a marker called secretory IgA. So this is a marker that can be measured in the stool, in the saliva, and in the blood. And it speaks to the function of our mucosal membranes. And mucosal membranes is basically like the lining of our gut and our intestines. And it actually starts all the way up in our mouth. And the higher amount of secretory IgA, if it's out of the normal range and it's really, really high, that means that the mucosal membrane is in a battle mode. Like there's probably a pathogen or a bad bacteria or a yeast. If the secretory IgA is very low or depleted, that means that we're experiencing leaky gut. And we see with anxiety and even just high stress, again, we don't have to deem it necessarily anxiety diagnostically, but high stress demand, anticipatory stress for you know going to a meeting or being in a new, again, social anxiety environment, secretory IgA goes up super, super high. And then residual impact is that it depletes. So I say that stress can literally drill holes in the gut lining. So even if you're like eating a perfect diet, if you don't manage your stress access, you could be dealing with pretty severe leaky gut. Now, what do you think is the biggest factor contributor causing or leading to leaky gut? So definitely a lot of medications contribute and within that chemicals. So a lot of us don't think of the fact that there's chlorine in in our tap water. You know, a lot of municipal water is going to use chlorine to fight off bacteria agents and chlorine itself has a huge role in sterilizing our microbiome, but also it can play a big role in actually creating more basically openings in the gut lining, the gut junctions and also food chemicals. So whether we're talking about cellulose gums, polysorbate 80, which is a preservative, carrageenan, and then of course, in the food system, gluten. Gluten interferes with our zonulin, and it actually interferes with the tight junctions of our lining of our gut. So it actually is going to create opening or epithelial damage in in those tight junctions, creating that opening or or leaky quote-unquote gut. And then there's other medications that can be damaging, like our NSAID drugs. So a lot of people take Advil, Aleve, ibuprofen daily for aches and pains that might be due to inflammatory foods in their diet, you know? So 
if they pull out gluten, corn, soy, which also in their in their own nature create gut damage, they might also not need the drugs that further perpetuate the gut damage. And I find that to be the biggest thing, the inflammatory foods and then the drugs and chemicals as the big drivers. And then as I mentioned, stress independently can create that damage as well. So I know when I'm doing like a big lecture or event, I really doubled down on GI lining powder, which has L-glutamine and diglycerized licorice root and aloe, which is going to deliver L-glutamine. L-glutamine is the fuel source and the building block for our gut cells. So that's the best compound to really help to repair gut lining. And when it's delivered with DGL and aloe, it provides this oopy goopy (laughs) kind of slow delivery and it really coats and soothes. And that can be a big tool to be preemptive when you know you're under stress to not have that, that gut damage impact. That's really great advice. Now, I'm really curious on your take on carnivore because one of the reasons that I was interested in carnivore and learning more about it for myself. And I know you're good friends with Danny Vega. And so I'm sure that you've been kind of observing his journey and Brian's and and everyone's. For me, I was interested in mostly because in order to forego all the flavor and variety that you know, greens and vegetables and carbs provide in our life, even when you're limiting them to just 20 or 30 grams per day. To me, there has to be some qualitative, powerful difference between, you know, having 20 to 30 grams per day and having zero that would make people want to do this, you know, because I mean, I did it for 30 days and I really missed carbs. And I was like, the main thing that I hear in interviewing people who've been doing carnivore for a while is that it stabilizes their mood and lowers anxiety. And there's even one situation where this family had tried absolutely everything and they were just down to meat and greens and then eliminating the greens eliminated the anxiety. So I'm really curious as to your impressions, you know, on carnivore, seeing it as a growing trend. And, you know, it probably, in your opinion, mostly has to do with removing inflammatory food sources, but I'd love to hear your take on it. Yeah. So I think it can be a good tool as reset. And uh, I was laughing because I don't know if you saw Danny ate sweet potato yesterday. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> so yeah. I oh, know, wow. <laughs> I know. Carb up. Uh, Carnivore know, carb right? up. <laughs> like, whoa, <laughs> where's the universe? Uh, the balance is off kilter. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it's a great reset. And I think everyone, first and foremost, everyone is biochemically unique, right? So we all have a different complexity to our system. And we've all come into this story with a long history of variability, you know, so I'm presenting at 34 years of wherever I've come from. And my biome and my birth story of my initial thumbprint of that started with whether I was vaginally birthed or cesarean, and then whether I was breastfed or not, and whether I was a high stress kiddo or not, and whether I was fed a standard American diet or not, you know, so there's so many pieces. And we present at the end of the day to a certain level of, of quote unquote damage or a certain level of resilience. And I think that the keto carnivore, when done correctly, meaning it incorporates a ancestralized approach. I'm not a fan of keto carnivore if you're going to eat just ground meat patties, right? Because you're not getting a good balance of glycine and proline. You're going to get too high of methionine and that's going to throw off your amino acids and that in its sense will throw off markers like homocysteine. But if you're getting a snout to tail philosophy, you're eating collagen, you're eating bone broth, you're eating organs and you're doing keto carnivore within that construct and you're eating tallow and lard, right? Getting enough high fats within it. Then I think it can be very therapeutic and very anti-inflammatory. And glycine in particular, which we see in the more collagen forming or fattier, grizzly type cuts of meats that have to be braised and slow cooked and such. Glycine is, as I mentioned, you know, magnesium bisglycinate. Glycine itself has a huge anti-anxiety impact, can help with insomnia, can help with mood stabilizing and influence. And so for many people, that in itself can be a really great benefit. And then yes, they're also removing the inflammatory compounds. And if we're talking about an elimination diet, It's a really great way because a lot of people do have intolerance to keto-friendly foods. Like maybe it's coconut, maybe it's avocado, maybe it is spinach. I've had people that have a severe red reaction. I use a blood test called the MRT test. I've had people have a reaction to 
off the charts, coconut or turmeric. So a lot of botanical compounds have anti-nutrients and many individuals have intolerances. So it's a great reset. And I also find that it can be very helpful for those that have done keto with non-caloric sweeteners. So maybe they haven't fully broken up with sugar. They've just kind of re put a disguise on quote unquote sugar addiction in its form of erythritol or xylitol or stevia. And so I think what's very cool about keto carnivore is it recalibrates your palate to 100% savory while it provides hopefully that balanced amino acid structure and gut healing properties. And then I think over... and. The last note I'll say is it also will help further, like you said, going from 30 to zero grams of carbs to really kill off any bad bacteria overgrowth. So then you can use that as a foundation and start to strategically, and I saw you've been doing that kind of strategically reintroducing foods to assess tolerance and how you feel from them, if you get bloated from them. And you can use that as a really gold standard as a a reset point. Yes, I actually did carnivore. Now this is my third round of it pretty much. The first time I did it for seven days and then 30 days and now I've been experimenting with reintroductions, but I'm still doing essentially carnivore because I'm just reintroducing one thing per week. And I made the mistake the first time that I did it on the seven days by just reintroducing all my favorite carbs that I really missed. And this time I'm doing it really, really deliberately and slowly and it's making all the difference. So I want to ask you, I know we think alike when it comes to sweeteners and not using them and more focusing on whole foods and having a more savory palate. But I also want to touch on that with you because I know it can affect the gut lining, especially sucralose can disrupt the gut bacteria. So what are some of the best things that people can do if they don't necessarily want to do an elimination protocol, you know, carnivore being one version of an elimination protocol. But if someone doesn't want to do an elimination protocol, what are some things that they can do to heal their gut, strengthen their gut lining and, you know, just improve their quality their gut microbiota as well. So I'm a huge fan, as I mentioned, of of bone broth. Bone broth is like a a facelift for the gut, (laughs) right? So I mean, beyond, (laughs) it is just like, and and it's so therapeutic and that's the most whole food form. So you can do your collagen peptides and you can use gelatin. Gelatin is definitely more therapeutic in a powdered form than collagen because it's inclusive of collagen, right? But you're getting more of that oopy goopy gelatinous delivery, which is going to have more of the epithelial repair, but bone broth even furthermore. And I let my bone broth go for 48 hours. And we love that when it's a hundred degrees outside (laughs) cooking it in our kitchen for 48 hours, but it is so fantastic. I sip a mug of bone broth every evening when I'm finishing up my patient charts and it has that gelatin in there. It also is going to have that L-glutamine that I mentioned before, which is that fuel source or building block for the gut lining and the gut cells. The enterocytes just eat that up and that's how they actually repair themselves. And then you're also going to get in the bone broth things like N-acetylcysteine, which helps with white blood cell regulation, supports the immune system system, can help with breaking down mucus and phlegm. And we get also GABA directly in bone broth. So the glutamine can convert into GABA in the brain. And again, that's that really nice mellower outer inhibitory compound. So again, looking chicken and egg, if you can get GABA in a whole food form from bone broth, that means you're less stressed, which means that you're not having the high stress creating the drills to damage your gut. (laughs) And then you're also repairing it with the bone broth itself. So in my book, I do a bunch of different fun recipes like a golden turmeric bone broth and a cream of spinach soup. And then then doing different options of making it into like a meal of a mug or just something to sip. And then we do a lot of gelatin gummies as well, because that's really great for the summer and for people that have, especially kiddos, if you can't get them to drink warm meat juice, <laughs> gelatin gummies, can be the <laughs> next best thing where you can still keep them keto. Like we use like lime and coconut water or coconut milk and lime zest and can make really palatable options. And I don't use any non-caloric sweeteners in any of my recipes. Now, what was that kind of realization for you? Did you use sweeteners in the past? What made you question having them as a part of your diet and lifestyle? And sort of what's been your thinking all around using them, not using them, all of that? Yeah, so I 
personally have always, I have a very big intolerance to like bloating and GI distress from sugar alcohols. And so that's helped for sure. I mean, to just not feel good eating something it makes you not want to eat it. <laughs> so that helps a lot. And then stevia and some of the other ones, I get a really pungent aftertaste. And I never, I actually did drink diet soda back in the day, you know, when I was like in my early teens, um, I was a ballerina. So I did drink diet soda. And I think when I started going into whole foods at Bastyr, we would go through this process of identifying what is a whole food. And you have to imagine it growing. Are all, are all of its edible parts intact? what's been done to it since slaughter or harvest, and then looking at the downstream processing. So my big kind of positioning on this is, again, even taking it from a meat standpoint, right? So like eating these whole foods, getting the collagen, eating things bone in, skin on, we're, we're going to be getting so much more nutritional benefits. If you look at a powdered or a clear liquid sweetener, that is so far from a whole food. You could not make that in your own kitchen. You know, you can't take corn and turn it into erythritol. You just can't (laughs) unless you have like a crazy chemical lab in your garage. (laughs) And so that just goes back to kind of my philosophy of if we're using food as medicine, we need to use these best pharmacy available to us. And I think that starts with what nature provides in a wholesome form. So, you know, I I'm okay. Technically my only gray area is I do allow people to use green stevia leaf that they grow and, you know, grind that up and, you know, in a moderate level, that's okay idea to use like in a smoothie or something like that. But I still want them to titrate it down because I want your palate to channel savory. I think for this to be a sustainable lifestyle, you need to appreciate the natural sweetness of a frozen macadamia nut with salt. You know, <laughs> like you need to like literally feel like your avocado with poor salt is sweet. You need to to really redefine what sweet tastes like because beyond the biome impact and the addictive tendencies, many of these, and then the GI intolerance, many of these non-caloric sweeteners are hundreds of times sweeter than table sugar. So they create a huge disconnect from our palate and what a whole food is. Exactly. I feel the exact same way if you can grow stevia in the plant form, just like mint or basil or any other herb and then use it in your tea or coffee or anything, then that's great. But in the processed and refined form, it really is not all that different from sugar. In fact, it is very similar in terms of its molecular structure to sugar itself. And there's also been studies done on the cephalic phase insulin response to sweetener. So as soon as the tongue tastes sweetness or a lack of bitterness, which sometimes happens just the sweeteners block bitterness. And uh, the body will prepare for this coming intake of sugar by releasing insulin. And then the insulin will push some of the glucose that's in the bloodstream into the cells and you'll get a drop in blood sugar. And that... creates all these cravings and things, which is just, to me, it's just not worth the energy of having to fight those things. It's very, very difficult to come off of sugar. And I know how difficult it was. I feel like I went through it twice because first I went off sugar and then I went off natural sweeteners. And I also went off artificial sweeteners as well. So maybe three times, but every single time it felt like a big shift. And it was very difficult for the first few days. But then after about a week, I wasn't even thinking about it anymore. So it's really just getting past those three, four days, sometimes a week, and then you're on the other side of it. But I often think that if I hadn't have had stevia, stevia, erythritol, if I hadn't have had those things, I may have actually never tried keto because I was such a sugar addict and such a high carb addict that I don't know that the premise of having a savory only diet would have appealed to me. I would have probably thought, no, that's just not something that I can do. So I really think that they have their place. And I'm very thankful that we have those things because I probably wouldn't have gone down this path if it weren't for having those substitutes and sweet things that I could have that didn't affect my blood sugar as much. And I also think that if they work for you, there's no reason why you need to remove them or give them up. But if they do create cravings for you or they do create this kind of dependency feeling that is similar to sugar, then you might benefit from going off them, but at least, you know, growing them in the herb form or using the least processed form of them is going to be optimal and avoiding sucralose, especially because it can affect the gut microbiome. It's so funny to me because my husband used to always say, you know, what's the one food that you wish was keto that isn't? And for me, it was always bananas, you know, straight face. I was always bananas. And after going carnivore, my 
taste receptors have reset even more than they had before. You know, already I was able to have 100% dark chocolate and all these vegetables taste very, very sweet to me. But after doing the carnivore experiment that I did, I had grilled eggplant twice now and it tasted as sweet to me as bananas. It tasted just like bananas. And you know, if eggplant can taste like bananas, I am fully here for that. And I'm not making this up. It actually happened when your tongue down regulates from all that upregulation of, you know, using these sweeteners and things. If you are inclined to try even a week just having savory foods only and not having any sweeteners, you'll be amazed at what it can do. Now, one of the things that I love the most about keto is how science backed it is. And I love looking at studies. I put a lot of them in my book. I know that you put a lot of them in your book too. So I want to talk about keto studies. Can we talk about some of the science that you have in your book? So with every R, of course, <laughs> we go into pretty deep scientific mechanisms. That was the dance between my publisher and I. They'd be like, you're talking like a pharmacist. <laughs> be a human. <laughs> it's like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so it's pretty geeky science, but I try to make it very relatable. One of the really interesting studies looked at mice and they looked at the distress from having the exposure to their mother and, and the baby mouse. And there was an electrical field. And the mouse, of course, would get shocked when they would try to go by the mother. And so they saw that there was a complete sterilization when they cultured the biome of the mouse. They did pre and post after a two week window of this electroshock distress time frame. And they saw complete sterilization, literally down to zero of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. And they saw a huge increase in LPS. And LPS, um, lipopolysaccharide, is a marker also of leaky gut. It tends to go up when the body is battling bad bacteria overgrowth. And it literally interferes with gut junctions. So it literally opens gut lining or is a driver of leaky gut. Then they repeated the study because they thought, well, maybe this was a physiological stress. We want to test now with a new set of population of mice. If they just have the emotional, I mean, it's wild to say mice have emotions, but just that distress of not being able to access mom. And they saw the exact same results. So a true zero sterilization of biome of lactobacillus and bifido and an enhancement or increase of LPS showing demonstration of leaky gut in a mouse that was not able to access mom or was put in a distress mode. So again, it's so wild to think that you could be eating a perfect diet. You could be doing again, keto carnivore or keto whole food or what, paleo keto, whatever you want to be doing and defining as optimal for your body. But again, if you're not addressing your HPA access, if you're not addressing and managing your stress response, that in itself could be sterilizing your biome, creating opportunistic bacteria to set up camp and driving leaky gut, which just perpetuates this vicious cycle of inflammation and agitation and anxiety. And I thought that that was really one of the most empowering studies that I referenced in my book. Now, I think that's awesome because it's just so wonderful to be able to reference studies and have people reference studies when anyone challenges them on keto being this bizarre, you know, way of life. It really isn't. It's just a whole foods lifestyle where you're replacing a lot of processed foods, a lot of sugar containing foods and high carb foods with real food that is nourishing, full of healthy fats, full of healthy proteins and providing lots of nutrients with low starch vegetables and fruits. And it really is not all that big of a stretch in the imagination, but it's so great to have these studies showing and proving and backing, you know, lowered mortality rates and massive quantities, long-term safety of ketogenic diets. Ketogenic diets being great for fat loss, muscle sparing, and, you know, all these different diagnoses and modern diseases. And I just love that you put so much of that science in your book. Now, I know we touched on this earlier, but what are some other tips you have for people for mood enhancement overall? Because mental health is such an important part of quality of life. So beyond bone breath, which is a huge component of it, we go into... So I do pull out dairy because there's a lot of studies on casein and I am from Wisconsin. So it was heartbreaking to do. <laughs> I was like, oh no, dairy association. And so I do pull out dairy for at least my, my book removes the inflammatory foods for the first 12 weeks. And then you can do, I talk you through how to do a strategic reintroduction, but we do a like quick coconut yogurt in the book. So we talk a lot about probiotic foods and fermentation and cultured vegetables to support the biome element. And then we also talk about prebiotic fibers that are still low carb, 
book. So use of things like Jerusalem artichoke and jicama and blending that into soups and such. We also go into a bunch of, it's very protein centric. So from anything from pork tenderloin to almond flour, chicken piccata to slow cooker carnitas. I talk a lot about, again, the nutrients in animal proteins. And my book actually opens with my story of being a recovering vegan (laughs) and dealing with panic attack when I was vegan. So I talk a lot about mechanisms of action of the animal compounds and how they're very therapeutic in the body and then different preparations within my lunch and dinner entrees and incorporate anti-inflammatory compounds in things like turmeric and curry powder, as well as alternatives for dairy, like my cashew cheese dip and mellow mama dressing. And I had so much fun writing and putting things together. And each chapter, I organize my recipes with those functional R's. So like, for instance, my almond collagen hot cocoa is going to be in the gut restoration chapter. And then I might focus on my matcha green smoothie because matcha has L-theanine in my neurotransmitter section. So each recipe has a food as medicine focus so that the reader can be empowered by the mechanism of action of that food, how it functions in their body, and then beyond the recipe and them enjoying the flavor combination, they can then focus on that ingredient in a whole array of different dishes throughout their their life truly well i am so so excited about your book i think the topic that you chose anxiety and that being your focus area is such an important topic and everyone who's experienced anxiety knows it is such a happiness thief and if you want to live a happy and full life it needs to be anxiety free and i think it's so so cool that there are so many physiological biological ways that we can help treat anxiety through whole foods nutrition diet and health and it's not just taking a pill or a drug but we can actually get to the root of some of the anxiety where it's coming from and i just want to congratulate you on finishing the book i know how much goes into writing a book and i'm so happy and excited for you now where can people follow the release of your book, follow more from you and get more information from you and what you do. Awesome. So everything is at Allie Miller RD. So that's my handle on all my social media platforms. And I'm always posting pretty much everything I eat. (laughs) So it's fun to come along for the ride. (laughs) And then my website is AllieMillerRD.com. So it's A-L-I-M-I-L-L-E-R rd.com and i have all my virtual programs and books and we'll definitely have a whole section under books and programs on the anti-anxiety diet awesome well be sure to put all the links in the show notes ali thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today and sharing all of your knowledge it is so helpful and i know that your book is going to help so many people out there so thank you for being here thanks vanessa it's my pleasure Hey guys, I hope that you enjoyed that episode with Allie Miller. I had such a great time chatting with her. I love her approach to health and healing and functional integrative medicine. She has so much experience and so much knowledge and it's just fascinating to chat with her. I mean, I don't know about you, I'm probably going to have to listen to that episode about three or four times and I was taking notes while she was talking as well. So she just has such a wealth of information. She's such a fountain of knowledge and uh, it was just a real treat to have her on and I'm sure that her book will be similar in terms of its incredible resources and recipes and information. So be sure to check out The Anti-Anxiety Diet, her brand new book that is coming out. Now, if you are interested in trying a keto diet for yourself or you've been doing for it for a while and just not seeing the results that you want to see, go check out the 28 Day Ketogenic Girl Challenge at ketogenicgirl.com and be sure to send me any questions that you have about the program the best way to send me any questions is on facebook the official facebook page is facebook front slash the ketogenic girl and i'm always over there coaching and supporting our members so if you send me a question on there usually get a reply within a few minutes so yeah if you have any questions about the 20 day challenge send them to me over there i hope that you have a fantastic fat fueled rest of your day and catch you on the next episode